The trouble with liberalism is the trouble with all heresies. It has no idea that it is a heresy. It believes that it developed sui generis, without parents, as a sudden insight of an enlightened mind which finally decided to be rational, see all men as equal, abhor slavery, recognize democracy as the ideal form of government, posit the nature of man as a self-interested actor, relegate religion to the sphere of private belief, and otherwise constitute the world of open elections and iPad sales that we know and love today. In fact, liberalism is an interpretation of scripture, the sum of many heretical commentaries on the Bible, which were extremely popular between the 16th and the 19th centuries, and which have now become normative. To live as a modern is simply to live out this set of commentaries without citing them. Unlike the medieval or the patristic commentary traditions, where orthodox and heterodox thinkers alike clearly set out to provide a gloss on a particular passage of scripture or an attack on a particularly onerous theology, liberalism blossoms within a literary tradition of long-windedness. As Jacques Ellul put it, a characteristic of this scientific literature is that it attempts to set down in one book the whole realm of knowledge. Within this tradition, no one bats an eye when Locke interprets the Tower of Babel as the establishment of a commonwealth in his treatises on government, when Hobbes calls Moses an absolute sovereign in the parts of Leviathan that no one reads, when John Adams includes in his correspondence with Thomas Jefferson an argument disdaining the, quote, total lack of political realism on the part of the Hebrew prophets. It falls to the critic to pull out the scriptural exegesis from the humanistic attempt to say everything about everything. But without addressing the liberal father's appeal to scripture, we fail to understand them, and thus their progeny, ourselves. Most fundamentally, liberalism is a retelling of the Genesis account of the Garden of Eden. This retelling is masked as a rational deduction of the original state of man prior to entering into society. But no one continues to pretend that Rousseau or Locke produced a more scientific account of mankind's beginning with their state of nature myths. They told another story. Elsewhere in this publication, D.C. Schindler articulates the soul of the new liberal Eden. By beginning with Adam as an individual, liberalism proceeds by positing an abstract nature, emptied of the actual substantial content that would immediately root nature in a concrete web of relations, and so anchor it in various natural hierarchies that co-determine the actuality of what it is. Genesis begins with an original society of male and female in dynamic relation with their creator. Liberalism subtracts the originality of society and calls man's individuality original instead. As a result, human relations become extrinsic meetings between sovereign individuals rather than the original truth of the human person who walks about in families. Genesis begins with Adam's dynamic ordination to till and to keep the world. Later theology clarifies that his mission is to freely, creatively transform the entire earth into a temple fit for God's praise. Liberalism subtracts this original mission from Adam, which only makes sense when man is described as originally belonging to a social order, and replaces it with the individualistic mission of survival. Adam tills and keeps to keep himself alive. To feel the truth of liberalism, that we are all self-interested individual survivors, is simply what it feels like to live out a material heresy, to see with the liberal lenses that have been given to us, Exiting liberalism requires shaking off liberalism's exegesis by, first of all, recognizing it as scriptural exegesis, rather than according to its own self-description as a post-biblical scientific deduction of the truth about man, and secondly, by relearning and believing orthodox exegesis of the scriptures that comes to us from the church, her fathers, and her saints. Thomas Malthus is especially instructive in this task. He famously articulated the basic principle which props up liberal economic theory. 
scarcity. We live his essay on the principle of population when we presume that human beings, by virtue of living within a world of scarce, finite, limited goods, can be described as racing against misery in a state of competition for individual survival. Rather less famously, Malthus, an Anglican priest, defended this vision of man in a rereading of Genesis. The reason for the rereading is obvious. If increased population dooms men to war for finite resources, then the Genesis blessing, be fruitful and multiply, is no blessing, but a curse. So Malthus sought to reconcile a scarce universe and a misery-damned humanity with a God of blessing and abundance. Malthus posited, first of all, that God was not omnipotent. The reason he created a universe of scarce resources was because he created under the necessity of developing the mind of man. Quote, to the great creator, almighty as he is, a certain process may be necessary, a certain time, or at least what appears to us as time, may be requisite in order to form beings with those exalted qualities of mind which will fit them for his high purposes. It is not the case that misery and toil are evils which man must bear insofar as he disobeys God. Rather, God creates the world with the intention that man will be threatened with misery, as it is precisely the threat of misery and death and the subsequent necessity of toil which serves as a process necessary to awaken inert, chaotic matter into spirit to sublimate the dust of the earth into soul, to elicit an ethereal spark from the clod of clay. This leads Malthus to assert his real heretical whopper, that the original sin of man is the torpor and corruption of the chaotic matter in which he may be said to be born. Let us be clear of the reasoning that now forms the substratum of our own. Matter is evil mind is good. To get mind out of matter, it was necessary that God make a scarce universe rather than a universe of abundant provision, because, quote, the first great awakeners of the mind seem to be the wants of the body. Toil instead of a punishment becomes the means of man's salvation from his original and sinful state of being mixed up with torpid matter. This description is, quote, fundamental because Malthus applies it not to man as a sinner, but for man as he is created by God. Malthus' heresies are expansive. He indulges in Manichaeism, with its assertion that matter is evil, dualism, in which evil is described as a necessary principle of creation, Pelagianism, with its optimistic belief that man, through toil, can attain his salvation, Gnosticism, by which the development of mind is posited as the true end of Christianity, and a few more, I don't doubt. Malthus' wiser friends encouraged him that his position was untenable, and he stripped his theological groundwork from all subsequent editions of the essay on population. This serves as a kind of metaphor for liberalism as a whole, in which a theological first edition is stricken from subsequent texts, which entire generations believe and carry in their backpacks, blithely unaware that the whole show once involved an immensely dubious reading of Scripture. When I say that Malthusian economics has been digested into the gut of every contemporary man, I do not mean that we have read Malthus, nor that, if we were to read him, we would agree with his dire predictions of overpopulation. I mean that we have absorbed his fundamental description of Adam, the original man, as a being who works because he is compelled by fear for his own survival. Malthus makes the threat of misery essential to the very existence of the human being, and thus describes all of man's possible actions as strife against the threat of a lack. This is a fundamental theme of classical liberalism, obvious in thinkers like Hobbes and Darwin, but equally present in the good guys, as in the theology of John Locke. As noted, Locke argued that Adam toiled in the Garden of Eden, quote, When God gave the world in common to all mankind, he commanded man to work, and man needed to work in order to survive, end quote. Working for his survival, man creates property, 
which Locke describes as belonging to the order of competition between men. Quote, a man who in obedience to this command of God subdued, tilled, and sowed any part of the earth's surface, thereby joined to that land something that was his property, something that no one else had any title to or could rightfully take from him, end quote. In our own lives, the liberal account of Adam's work in the garden plays out in our inability to rest, to enjoy things for their own sake, to do anything that doesn't give us money or property, to appreciate art, to imagine a society that does not operate on the principle of competition or a world that is not scarce but abundant. But it is most apparent in our worship of technology. As Joseph Ratzinger puts it, Technology originally arose as the means for assuring man's security. In this respect, technology is a great good, a tremendous capacity of the human beings to see the world as parts and resources that can be ordered into systems and devices that solve problems, cure diseases, and otherwise fill needs. In another respect, technology is the offspring of famine, war, and death a shield flung up against the fiery sword that cast mankind out of paradise, a desperate ordering of nature's goods into the effort of staving off death and dearth. Our oscillating opinions about technology, praising it as our future and fearing it as our apocalypse, are grounded in this fact. Behind every technological device is an imperfection that it purports to heal. If Malthus, Locke, and all the rest are correct, that man is created in and through his confrontation with lack, then man's natural gaze must be technological. The book of Genesis takes an opposite view. It actively rejects the description of the world as scarce, and it castigates the technological gaze. Genesis describes Adam as the one who perfects other created beings. The plants are not made except insofar as Adam exists to till them. Quote, no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. Likewise, as St. Ephraim the Syrian says, the animals came to Adam as a loving shepherd. The keeping of Adam, which the fathers took in the allegorical sense of keeping the commandment, probably referred in the literal sense to shepherding, as in Genesis 30, verse 31, and 1 Samuel 17, verse 20. And just as his presence perfects the plants of the field, his shepherding perfects and finishes the animals. Quote, Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Thomas Aquinas argues concerning Adam that, quote, God created things not only for their own existence, but also that they might be the principles of other things. Thus, when the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till and keep it, we can understand this tilling and keeping as the fulfillment of the nature of plants that waited for their gardener and the animals that waited to be named by their shepherd, their principle of perfection. At this original juncture, labor is not toilsome, but restful. As St. Augustine says, although man was placed in paradise so as to work and guard it, that praiseworthy work was not toilsome. To till and keep what one is created to till and keep can no more be described as toil for survival than breathing or laughing at a joke. Already we begin to catch a glimmer of the orthodoxy from which Malthus departs. There is a kind of work that is not performed for the sake of survival, for fear of a lack, and out of competitive self-interest. It is that work by which man acts according to his nature as a principle of perfection of other beings, as a gardener and shepherd of this earth. This work is restful. Rest does not indicate a lack of activity, as Malthus seemed to assume. As Aquinas puts it, God did act on the seventh day, not by creating new creatures, but by directing and moving his creatures to the work proper to them. If God in his Sabbath rest sustains creation in being and moves it towards its perfection, Adam, made in the image of God, 
participates in this work which is not toil, directing and moving God's creatures to their perfection. This non-technological making, motivated by our nature as gardeners of the world, is difficult to feel and to find outside of the Garden of Eden. But this is no reason to declare it non-existent and never having been. We experience glimmers of Eden in our daily lives. To be the master of a tool or of a skill is to have it as a second nature. The child learning to use a hammer toils. He feels it as a thing, a wooden shaft with a heavy metal end that he must manipulate through space in order to accomplish his aspirations to carpentry. The hammer resists him. He bashes his thumb, misses the nail, loses his grip. But as he works and learns, he enters into communion with the tool. He no longer aims the hammer at the nail. He hammers the nail, knowing that it will land with the same certainty that he knows his fingernail will land on his nose when he moves to scratch it. Through repeated actions, the hammer becomes an extension of his body. He masters the tool. Likewise, the amateur gardener toils to perfect the skill of gardening. Insofar as he is an amateur, his skill is only an ideal that his hoeing and pruning tends towards, a body of knowledge that he must continuously look up, get wrong, and look up again. But the man who has gardening as a habit and a perfection of a power of the soul does not fight with the soil. His toil is no toil. His work has become his rest. His labor is enjoyable. His technique is no longer technical, but a second nature. What mastery we enjoy is a hard-earned and fragile product of toil. The mastery Adam enjoyed, he enjoyed because he was created as the natural principle of perfection for the garden in which he was planted. We labor to incorporate the tool and its technique into our bodies. Aquinas argues that in the state of innocence, Adam's work is already incorporated into his body. Of the body itself, man is master not by commanding, but by using. Likewise, in the state of innocence, man's mastership over plants and inanimate things consisted not in commanding or in changing them, but in making use of them without hindrance. But mastery alone is insufficient to assure that work is restful. A man could perfect a skill and still find the use of it loathsome and wearying. Aquinas argues that God created man to dress and keep paradise, which dressing would not have involved labor, as it did after sin, but would have been pleasant on account of man's practical knowledge of the powers of nature. Perfect knowledge of the beings upon which one works is also required to rid work of its toilsome aspect. We see this dimly in the phenomenon by which a labor of love does not seem to be a labor at all. A mother who feeds her child enjoys her work, insofar as she wants to perfect the child, insofar as she knows and loves the child and understands that her labor shepherds that child into its full stature. Aquinas seems to extend the pleasure of love's labors to all the labors of paradise. Adam, like Eve, is the mother of all the living, the one who nurtures the world to its proper perfection and thus does not loathe to labor, but delights in it. The vision of the restful man for whom the world waits, as for its principle of perfection, is not spoken by the authors of Genesis in a vacuum, but as a polemic against the dominant myths of the nations with which they warred. The Atrahasis epic, which contains the stories of the flood and the ark, which the authors of Genesis obviously confronted, likewise contains a description of the reason for man's existence. When the gods were man, they did force labor. They bore drudgery. Great indeed was the drudgery of the gods. The forced labor was heavy, the misery too much. As in Malthus, there is nothing prior to drudgery. It is concomitant with existence. The solution sought by the gods is not to redeem toil, but to vacate themselves from it. They look for one who they will force to toil for them. They create a state in which a few escape drudgery and misery by a relative increase in the drudgery and misery of others. 
the seven great Anuna gods were burdening the Igigi gods, the lesser gods, with forced labor. The myth describes creation itself as the product of slaves serving their masters. The lesser gods dug the Tigris River and the Euphrates thereafter. Genesis subverts the dominant mythologies when it describes a creation that is freely given, in which both the Tigris and the Euphrates flow out of Eden to water the garden, and there is peace. In Atrahasis, there is class war. Quote, let us face up to our foreman, the prefect. He must take off our heavy burden upon us. Now them, call for battle. Battle, let us join. Warfare. The gods heard his words. They set fire to their tools. They put fire to their spaces and flame to their work baskets. Ultimately, the insurrection of the slave gods is quelled by the suggestion that human beings be created. Belet Eli, the midwife, is present. Let her create then a human, a man. Let him bear the yoke. Let him bear the yoke. Let man assume the drudgery of the god. Genesis attacks the myths by asserting that man was not made for toil. Rather, toil was an invention of sinful man. It undermines any attempts to build a society on the basis of slave labor by undercutting the idea that toil is man's lot. If by it one means that man toils by nature in the order of creation rather than by punishment in the order of the fall. The technological gaze, which the myth makers describe as the very reason for man's existence, is castigated as belonging to a world of sin. In the liberal retelling of Genesis, the technological gaze is made fundamental, and Adam is described as the deficient one who must toil against a surrounding lack in order to be properly made man. Liberalism, as a reading of scripture, ends in the same position as the paganism that scripture sought to destroy. A post-liberal reading of the Genesis text would be rid of the presumption of scarcity, that liberal presupposition that describes man as individual toiling after scarce resources. This presupposition is contained within the Genesis text, but it does not describe the original man, but man in his sin and disobedience. Man in his original state was given the polar opposite mission, to maintain a presumption of abundance. God gives Adam every tree of the garden, but commands him not to eat from the tree. The early Christian church emphasized this in the tradition of lamenting over Adam's foolishness, the commandment was an easy one, St. Ephraim the Syrian says, for God gave to Adam all of paradise and withheld from him only one tree. The Adoret of Cyrus argues that for Adam, while he regaled with an abundance of fruits of all kinds, the eating of one alone was forbidden. St. John Chrysostom considers this as evidence of God's abundant provision. Even the phrase, that one tree bears a slight nuisance. Surely I didn't inhibit your enjoyment, it is saying. Did I not relieve you of every need? For these church fathers, the commandment forbidding one tree was a trial, not of Adam's ability to blindly obey an arbitrary will, but of his ability to trust that God provides. Adam was tried in his capacity to retain a presumption of abundance, to rest in the many instead of fretting over the meager to rejoice in the gifts of God rather than tremble for fear in the dark light of some perceived lack. This helps explain the demythologizing trend in the early church concerning the fruit of the tree. The fathers deliberately downplayed the impulse to think of the fruit as something that could fulfill a desperate lack in Adam and Eve's hearts. The forbidden fruit was nothing special. It wasn't because the tree of knowledge supplied knowledge, it is called that, says Chrysostom but because the transgression of the command happened to concern the tree, and from that event, knowledge of sin entered the scene. It is the lying serpent, not God, who presents the tree and its fruit as containing special powers which Eve needs to obtain. God merely says, in the day you eat of it, you will die. The serpent argues that 
When you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. The snake presents for the first time the idea of a lack sucking away at the human condition, a lack of sight and of divinity. Says St. Ambrose, what other cause of enmity is there except envy? As Solomon says, by the envy of the devil, death came into this world. But as Aquinas notes, man can only replicate the devil's envy by viewing human nature as lacking in relation to the divine nature. The newness of the serpent-bitten gaze is signified by a textual addition. Only two things are predicated of the trees of the garden. God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. When Eve reaches out to take the fruit, she does so because the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. Thus far, she is drawn by the good of the tree as it is given by God. But the Genesis account adds that Eve also saw that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. This quality was not given through God's creation of the tree. It comes from the presumption of lack, of man's being not wise. This, therefore, says St. Ambrose in the voice of the serpent, is my first approach, namely to deceive him while he is desirous of improving his condition. The disobedience of Adam and Eve does not, by itself, summarize their failure of the great trial. Rather, their disobedience is predicated on a first failure. They looked upon themselves as the proper objects of self-help. They presumed themselves scarce. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Adam and Eve view themselves as lacking over and against the commandment from God to rest in the abundance of his grace. The result is that they appear to be naked. The relation of nakedness to sexual shame has been well drawn out, but throughout the Hebrew scripture, being naked refers as often to want and scarcity as it does to sexual shame. Augustine argues that man saw his nakedness and was displeasing to himself because he did not have anything of his own. Chrysostom describes the fall, saying, Adam and Eve were reduced to the utmost indigence after the great abundance of their wealth. The scarcity which Eve posits in regards to her wisdom and divine status spreads out until it garbs and smothers her whole body. The fear of our first parents was a self-fulfilling prophecy. They knew that they were naked because they acted as if they were naked. For Hobbes, the shame Adam and Eve feel over their naked bodies is a critique of God's absolute power to create them as he willed. Quote, the meaning is plain that it was then they first judged their nakedness, wherein it was God's will to create them, to be uncomely, and by being ashamed did tacitly censure God himself. But if we could unsmear the grease of liberalism from our glasses long enough to gaze on Adam and Eve as they flutter and fret about for fig leaves, if we could see them as the first beings to presume of scarcity in the face of God-given abundance, we would not simply see rebels against an absolutist deity, but the inventors of technology. This is difficult to describe, as we are accustomed to thinking of technology as the sum total of technological devices. But as Heidegger describes it, Technology is the mode of being which allows us to produce technological devices, a gaze which sees the world as orderable to the fulfillment of our needs. In his language, we quote, set upon the real in order to reveal it as standing reserve, wherein everything is ordered to stand by, to be immediately at hand. Forests become reserves of wood, rivers become energy resources, and human beings become human capital, all of it ordered to the fulfillment of need, the staving off of scarcity, the reduction of lack. In order to think technologically, it is necessary to view man as lacking. After the fall, this hardly requires an effort. 
sinful man is lacking. And so creation appears to us as eminently orderable to the fulfillment of his lack, the cure of his disease, the remedy for his innumerable inadequacies. But before the fall, when man did not actually lack anything, this newfound technological gaze was absurd, poisonous, destroying the Edenic gaze. In the Edenic gaze, man tills and keeps creation because he is its shepherd, ordained to foster the garden of the world into perfection. In the technological gaze, man toils because his penury forces him to, as we have heard Locke say. He cares not one whit for the perfection of the natures of the creatures that he orders into his technological systems. He cares about his survival, his benefit. When Adam and Eve viewed themselves as lacking, they fulfilled the necessary condition for viewing themselves and all of creation technologically. They viewed creation as ordered towards the fulfillment of their lack. When God condemns Adam to toil, it is not a divine hand slap extrinsic to Adam's presumption of scarcity beneath the tree of knowledge. Toil flows from the technological gaze as blood flows from a wound. Edenic tilling and keeping is restful because it views man and creation as ordained to each other's mutual perfection. Adam's use of creation could not have involved violence or striving, for again, as Aquinas argues, God created man to dress and keep paradise, which dressing would not have involved labor, as it did after sin, but would have been pleasant on account of man's practical knowledge of the powers of nature. But Adam and Eve willfully ceased to participate in this practical knowledge of the nature of things by seeing things not as they are given by God, but only insofar as they satiate man's lack, seeing the tree not as one only, but as desirable for making one wise. This is why the first act after the fall of man is also man's first act of technological creation. Adam and Eve sew fig leaves into aprons. They agree with the serpent, believe themselves to be lacking, see themselves as naked, and so begin to strive against scarcity, to order creation to the covering of their nakedness, and the fulfillment of their lack, through a work which is not restful, but toilsome. There is a Jewish tradition linking toil, not simply to man's punishment, but directly to this sin. Rabbi Isaac said, Thou hast acted sinfully, then take thread and sew. And a translator's note explains, i.e. because of your sin you must henceforth toil. Thus, the immediate consequence of their sin was that they had to begin sowing. Our actions form our habits, our second nature, and our stable dispositions in a process the phenomenologist Maurice Merleau-Ponty described as a rearrangement and renewal of the corporeal schema. For Merleau-Ponty, these habits are not purely psychological realities, ingrained patterns inside our brains. Rather, habit has its abode neither in thought nor in the objective body, but in the body as mediator of a world. This is the phenomenological addition Merleau-Ponty strove to bring to the Aristotelian and Thomistic doctrine of the habits, the world which is always given to and appearing to us changes as we acquire new habits. Thus, the space of the football player is not the same space of the man who mows the field. For the player in action, the football field is not an object. The player becomes one with it and feels the direction of the goal, for example, just as immediately as the vertical and horizontal planes of his own body. The kind of world we have depends on our habits. The body is our general medium for having a world. Sometimes it is restricted to the actions necessary for the conservation of life, and accordingly it posits around itself a biological world. Habit is merely a form of this fundamental power. What is often described as an Edenic harmony between man and nature is a description of precisely this insight, that the world appears to man according to his habits. 
insofar as Adam is perfected by God's grace in the capacities of his soul, he remains in Eden, that state in which creation appears as perfect. Indeed, it is an interpretation of the fathers that the nakedness of Adam was revealed in accordance with his loss of good habits or virtues. They were naked, it is true, before this time, says Ambrose, but they were not devoid of the garments of virtue. Through disobedience, Adam rejected those abundantly given, infused theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, which God freely gave Adam in order to lift him beyond his nature into friendship with himself. Through this rejection of love, he lost even the natural virtues, habits by which every one of his acts was perfectly in accord with his own nature and the nature of the objects upon which he acted, that is, by which all his acts were without violence or toil. Man, perfected in wisdom, acted as one who lacks wisdom. This sin rearranges the world. Instead of orientating things to their proper perfection, Adam orientates things towards himself. The tree of knowledge is not used according to its nature for the mutual fulfillment of the tree and its keeper. The tree is used against its nature for the fulfillment of a falsely presumed lack within the human condition. This destroys the possibility that Adam's labor can remain a labor of love orientated towards the perfection of the beloved. Acting against the nature of a thing is not an act of love, but an act of violence. And so the fig leaves which Adam and Eve orientate into covering their poverty, stripped from the tree, will die, just as garments of skin with which God clothes them come from animals who die as a sign of man's mortality. God and all of creation regard Adam warily as the anti-shepherd, who violently puts forth his hand and takes to cover his own nakedness, a violent man against whom there is no remedy but restraint, coercion, a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The fact that the world changes as a result of a change in Adam's action is not an arbitrary punishment of God. Rather, actions are the source of habits, and habits are a form of this fundamental power of the body for positing a world, and thus the world appears according to the habits which form it. Insofar as man remained obedient, perfected by grace in the habits of his soul, all of the earth would continue to appear to him as a paradise. But man who deforms himself in sin can only be the recipient of a deformed world. When Adam eats of the fruit, Nature turns against him, not by a secondary creation of new and malicious plants and animals, as John Calvin argues, but because man gives up the perfection of his nature, which knows the animals and plants by name and stands as their principle of perfection. There were always thorns and thistles. Thistles are only a problem to a man who no longer understands them according to their nature. Thorns are a problem to the man who takes up a new view, one in which nature exists to fill a lack. Then the appearance of a thorn becomes a privation, for how can a thorn serve man's needs? How can a thistle be used against the threat of privation? Aquinas argues for this view when he says that if man had not sinned, the earth would have brought forth thorns and thistles, but that these would have been understood not as primarily in relation to man, rather as being created to be the food of animals, not to punish man, because their growth would bring no labor or punishment for the tiller of the soil. As we have already seen, Aquinas believes that the reason the tiller of the soil does not labor in paradise is that tilling would have been pleasant on account of man's practical knowledge. And so we can conclude that an infused practical knowledge of the nature of the thorn and the thistle, their properties, potencies, and perfections, would have enabled Adam to till and keep in such a way that man, thorn, thistle, field, goat, and pig were all perfected without violence. 
The appearance of the thorn and the thistle in the field of man's labor, then, are not images of an arbitrary punishment of a god riled over an insult to his absolute sovereignty. They are images of the manner in which the world appears to one who presumes that creation is scarce and that he is lacking. Merleau-Ponty describes the new world that emanates out of a new habit with the description of an organist, a man who has organ playing as an interior disposition and muscle memory. Quote, it is not in objective space that the organist, in fact, is playing. In reality, his movements are consecratory gestures. They create a space of expressiveness as the movements of the auger delimit the templum or temple. Likewise, it is not in some objective Newtonian space that Adam lives and moves. His movements are consecrating gestures which cause the world to appear in relation to his habits. Adam's thirsty riven grasping to fulfill a lack reveals the world as thirsty, riven, and graspable. His disobedience takes things not as God creates them, nor, what is the same, according to its nature and his vocation as a shepherd to the nature of things, but as fearful man would have it. Adam is the priest who is to consecrate the world into a temple by remaining perfect and thus serving as the principle of perfection for all things. By this same token, he is the one who may, by his nature as free, embodied intelligence, break the world and take up a gaze which sees the temple and the garden as a field ordered to man, a field in which thorns and thistles can only appear as adversaries, as they no longer fit into the space of Adam, who posits about himself a world ordered toward survival, competition, and the fulfillment of lack. In many ways, the heresy of liberalism is a tiny one, mistaken by a matter of minutes. It takes as a part of the order of creation what is, in fact, of the order of the fall, arguing that man strove against scarcity in the state of nature. This crowns the presumption of scarcity not as a temptation of the fallen world, but as the goal of every Christian who longs for the redemption of the world in Christ. This crowns technology not as a response to man's fallenness, which will pass away in the redemption, but is man's very reason for being. While it is beyond the goal of this essay to show how this theology of scarcity justified and girded the Western expansion of the technocratic state, it does not take a particularly incisive intelligence to connect the dots. Suffice to say that the degree to which we believe and live out the liberal thesis, that Adam is a rational, self-interested actor competing for happiness and survival in a world of scarce goods, is the degree to which the world will really appear in this manner, as it appeared to Adam and Eve that dark day under the tree.